And today I want to talk about a joint work with Moody Sagil, Sharon Schramm, and James Wilcox that was published in uh, Last Popper. And it's about invariant inference, which is a form of uh, automatic, automatic verification. And in automatic verification, we are given some uh, program and some specification that the program is supposed to adhere to. And we want to have a proof of correctness, a proof that the program indeed adheres to the specification. And we want to find it by feeding the program and the specification into some super intelligent algorithm that automatically can produce that proof of correctness. So this is uh, automatic verification in general. Uh, more specifically today, I want to focus about one of the fundamental problems in verification, which is uh, safety verification, the safety problem of transition systems. So suppose, for example, we have a system over uh, n, n plus one propositional variables representing a number in binary, which starts from zero, and in each step, it's incremented by two. Uh, so it goes from uh, zero to two to four and, and so on. So this defines the reachable states of the system. And we want to prove that no reachable state is dead. And here dead would mean being uh, this number, uh, one, zero, 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 one, which is uh, two to the n plus one. So we want to prove that if we start from zero and iteratively add two, we can't get to this number. To do that, we want to find an inductive invariant, which is a set of states that uh, contain the initial states, exclude all the bad states, and uh, it's closed under transitions of the system, it's inductive. So if you start from a state inside the invariant and make a transition, you also end up in a state inside the invariant. So for example, the property that the number is never the bad number, of course holds, it's an invariant, but it's not an inductive invariant because there is a transition from a state uh, that's not the bad number, which by adding to gets to the bad number. So this uh, uh, property is not inductive. It's not closed under transitions of the system. Uh, but we can strengthen this property to say that uh, the number is always even. The least significant bit is uh, always 0. And this is an inductive invariant. If you start from an even number and add 2, you also, add, you also end up with an even number. Maybe you've heard of that before. Once we have such an inductive invariant, uh, it contains all the reachable states of the system, and uh, this can be shown by induction, and it excludes all the bad states, showing that uh, all the reachable states are not bad. In this case, this is because um, it shows that all the reachable states are even, and the bad number is not even. So the goal uh, of invariant inference is to automatically find such inductive invariants, resulting in fully automatic uh, safety verification. So this is what we would like to do. One of the latest breakthroughs in invariant inference is an algorithm called IC3PDR, which was published in 2011 and was recognized quickly afterwards as a very, very big thing. So for example, the HVC award from the subsequent year cites reports of leading performance on hardware verification problems and the fact that IC3 has innovated this mature research area in what by now includes not only the verification of hardware, but also adaptations of the algorithm to software verification. So this is a very, very super intelligent algorithm. Uh, I think one of the big questions is why? Why is it such a super intelligent, wonderful algorithm? Surely science holds the answer. Unfortunately, science doesn't tell us much about IC3 PDR. Uh, I first came to grapple with this uh, mystery in some uh, work that uh, we did uh, to improve invariant inference for distributed protocols, where we, uh, using some guidance from the user, we could transform the problem from the usual inductive invariant inference problem to uh, something uh, slightly different that incorporates some temporal intuition. Uh, then we uh, ran IC3PDR, uh, essentially the same algorithm before the transformation on the user usual invariant inference problem and uh, on the slightly modified problem. And it turned, it turned out that in some cases, um, uh, after the transformation, IC3PDR is super intelligent, whereas before it wasn't uh, so much. Uh, so I was really happy about these results. And then uh, people started asking me, you know, why? Why does this transformation make such a, such a big difference to the algorithm? Um, and uh, my initial reaction was, I don't know. Then we came up with uh, some intuition or um, explanations of why this uh, why this occurs and we also had some empirical data to explain it but uh, uh, i felt at least 
that uh, this was a very far from a satisfactory answer or satisfact satisfactory explanation of the process. Um, uh, and it, I, I think the, the problem really was that we had uh, no uh, 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 conceptual or theoretical framework that could uh, uh, that was able to uh, reason about the performance of the algorithm and explain when it works well, when it doesn't work well, um, uh, and, and what could uh, make it tick. Uh, so uh, ever since we have been trying to uh, develop our first attempt of a theory of uh, uh, invariant inference algorithms, modern invariant inference algorithms, that's uh, founded on the classical theory, uh, classical learning theory, specifically uh, exact concept learning with queries, Angular style, if you're familiar with that, uh, building on uh, uh, the fact that invariant inference is not unlike classification, but it's not quite classification. So it's not, it's not unlike classification in that uh, uh, in both cases, there's the need to separate good points from bad points using some, uh, some set that may have a complex geometric shape or maybe uh, complicated to, uh, uh, to express syntactically. This I call the challenge of, of space. But in that inference and learning theory is, uh, uh, they're, they're not exactly the same. And this is because uh, the, in, in that inference, there's also the, the challenge of time. So what defines good and bad points in that inference is actually uh, uh, reachability in the transition systems or how the program uh, uh, goes uh, in time. Uh, and this uh, uh, does have a significant, uh, uh, causes significant differences um, uh, between invariant inference and exact concept learning. So uh, we have in invariant inference both the challenges of space and time. And today I want to focus about the challenge of time and how it's handled in IC3PDR. Uh, and seemingly this doesn't have anything to do with uh, exact learning because this is where invariant inference and classical learning differ from each other. Uh, and to our surprise, it turned out that actually tools that were developed in, uh, in exact concept learning are actually instrumental to understand uh, uh, some of the principles of IC3PDR and how it handles time. Um, so this is what I want to talk about today. Uh, so what I would like to show is that uh, PDR can be roughly understood as an abstract interpretation procedure in a new abstract domain that's based on work by uh, Beshuti, originally in the context of exact concept learning, uh, what's called the monotone theory. And we were surprised by this, both, both because we didn't, we, did, we didn't expect the monotone theory to come up in this setting. And also uh, and in the other direction, we were also surprised by this because if you look at PDR, it mostly doesn't look like abstract interpretation. So somehow uh, this, uh, uh, the use of the monotone theory did allow us to uh, see some connection between seemingly two un mostly unrelated techniques. Uh, and it's significant because it partially answers a very important question about PDR, which is how it is able to over approximate rather than stick to the set of states that are exactly reachable, which is a key concern for every invariant inference algorithm trying to overcome the problem of time. So this is what I, I, I'd like to, to start with. Uh, the, what's the challenge of over approximation? Um, uh, and then we'll see how it's uh, uh, our understanding of how it's handled in IC3PDR. And to do that, I would like to uh, talk a, a bit more about what's actually what actually happens in PDR and its uh, central data structure, which is the frames. So the frames are a sequence of formulas that uh, PDR maintains, or equivalently, these are the uh, this is a sequence of sets of states, uh, the states uh, that satisfy uh, each of the formulas. Uh, and the, uh, the frames satisfy several uh, basic uh, properties. So they, they start from the set of initial states. The, the first frame is just the set of initial states of the system. The frames go monotonically. Each frame contains the previous one. Moreover, each frame contains the post image of, of the previous one. So um, uh, uh, each frame contains all the states reachable in one step from the previous frame, but the frames don't include any of the bad states. So these are the, the usual uh, properties of frames uh, in, in virtually every explanation of IC3PDR. And uh, they guarantee that when they, this sequence converges, 
with two frames are equivalent, then this is an, uh, forms an inductive invariant and the algorithm is done. Uh, another consequence, important consequence of these properties is that they ensure that uh, each frame I contains all the states that are reachable in the system in I steps. So the first frame contains all the states reachable in one step. The second frame contains all the reachable, all the states reachable in two steps and, and so on. So, so far, this is uh, the usual explanation of uh, PDR and PDR's frames. Um, and uh, I, I would like to argue that uh, uh, something is missing from this explanation. It's not enough to say that this uh, sequence eventually converges and that uh, uh, each frame I contains uh, the states of the system reachable in I steps. They need, each frame needs to include many states beyond that. Otherwise, this is not PDR. This is an algorithm called exact forward reachability. And, and we know that exact forward reachability may take many, many iterations before it converges to an inductive invariant. For example, in the example uh, system we had at the beginning, which starts from zero and iteratively adds two, the, the states reachable in I steps, or I steps or less, are the even numbers less than or equal to two I. And only at an, an exponential index, after exponentially many iterations, this arrives at uh, all the even numbers, which is the inductive invariant. So uh, if we stick to the states that are exactly reachable in the system, the algorithm converges, exact forward reachability converges only after exponentially many iterations in this case. So uh, in order to converge quickly, PDR needs to over approximate and in each frame include many states beyond those that are exactly reachable. So this is the question of over approximation and uh, uh, how this over approximation is performed in, and what can be guaranteed about it in IC3 PDR, we want to understand it theoretically. To do so, we introduce a Lambda PDR, a theoretical algorithm that's a simplification of standard PDR. And we study over approximation in Lambda PDR. The reason is that PDR, standard PDR, performs at least as much over approximation as Lambda PDR. So whatever over approximation is performed, we can show is performed in Lambda PDR, it's also performed in standard PDR. We show that Lambda PDR is equivalent to an abstract interpretation procedure in an abstract, abstract domain where the abstraction function is the monotone Hull theory, uh, sorry, monotone Hull operator from the monotone theory. And we show that this can lead to significant over approximation and at times an exponential gap between the number of frames required for Lambda PDR to find an invariant and the number of iterations required for exact forward reachability to do the same. Uh, and we also provide general bounds on the number of, uh, on number of frames before PDR, Lambda PDR converges, um, uh, expressed using uh, syntactic properties of the transition system the algorithm is analyzing, uh, bringing together results from uh, abstract interpretation, the monotone theory, and the completeness thresholds for bounded model checking. Um, if anyone wants to ask something so far. OK. Uh, so uh, let's start by talking about uh, Lambda PDR. And, and to do that, we need to dive a bit more deeply into how PDR actually constructs the sequence of frames. So conceptually, PDR looks at BK, the set of states that can reach a bad state in K steps, and checks whether there's a, a counterexample, a state in BK that's included in one of the frames. Such a state cannot belong to any inductive invariant because in an inductive invariant, no state can reach a bad state in any number of steps. So uh, PDR wants to uh, exclude the counterexample from the frame by finding some uh, lemma C that when we conjoin it to the frame, it excludes the counterexample from the frame. We still need to satisfy all the frame properties uh, of PDR. So this frame, this lemma needs to hold for all the states that are reachable in one step from the previous frame. Moreover, this uh, lemma is not just an arbitrary formula, but it's always a clause, a disjunction of variables and negation of, of variables. Uh, for example, it could be uh, this clause. OK, so overall, each frame in PDR consists of uh, some conjunction of clauses that uh, hold for uh, or contain all the states reachable in one step from the previous frame 
And each of them excludes at least one counterexample from the set BK, the set of states that reach a, a, bad, a bad state in at most k steps. So the idea of lambda PDR is to think not about some uh, conjunction of such clauses, but a very specific conjunction, which is just the conjunction of all the clauses, all the clauses that uh, satisfy these properties. This gives us uh, an algorithm that can, uh, starting from the first frame of the initial state, can uh, compute frames iteratively one by one, um, where each frame is taken to be the conjunction of all the clauses that contain all the, the states reachable in one step from the previous frame of lambda PDR and exclude some, uh, at least one counterexample from BK. And so this is computed iteratively. Uh, and uh, here in, in lambda PDR, K is a parameter of the algorithm. So if uh, uh, this gives us a different set of, of frames than the frames of standard PDR, but they can be related to those of uh, standard PDR. Um, because as sets of states, each frame of PDR contains uh, uh, the corresponding frame of lambda PDR. So um, uh, the frames of standard PDR are, are larger. They contain more states than the frames of lambda PDR. If you're familiar with the, the actual mechanics of PDR, then um, uh, one way to think about it is that PDR learns uh, uh, several lemmas simultaneously to refine multiple frames uh, using uh, multiple uh, counterexamples or uh, one counterexample trace. Um, and, uh, and Lambda PDR is sort of an eager version of that, uh, where we always refine only the frontier frame, but, uh, but the, the lemmas that PDR learns for, uh, uh, for as supporting lemmas in previous frames, we, uh, uh, when we get to the frontier frame, these are, uh, we have already learned them um, uh, in, in previous iterations when we constructed the previous frames. So Lambda PDR is sort of an eager version of standard PDR. And uh, because uh, Lambda PDR is a bigger conjunction, each frame in Lambda PDR forms a bigger conjunction than the frame of, uh, of standard PDR, uh, a bigger conjunction, it excludes more states, uh, less states are satisfied by the formula. And so we have this relation that as sets of states, the frame of lambda PDR is a subset of the, the frame of standard PDR. The reason this is uh, uh, interesting and important uh, is that uh, now uh, once we can show that lambda PDR performs significant over approximation in each frame of lambda PDR, there are many states beyond those that are exactly reachable then this also translates to standard PDRs frames because they are uh, only larger. Uh, so our goal now is to show that indeed Lambda PDR performs significant over approximation. And, and to do that, let's think uh, about the example we had before uh, where we start from zero and iteratively add two. So uh, if we execute Lambda PDR with uh, the choice uh, of K equals zero, so BK is simply the set of bad states, then we can calculate, and we do this in the paper, that the first frame uh, corresponds to all the even numbers where the most significant bit is zero. Uh, and the second frame of lambda PDR actually converges to the inductive invariant, which contains all the even numbers. This is in stark contrast to what happens with exact forward reachability, where the states that are reachable in i steps or less are the even numbers less than or equal to 2i. And this arrives at all the even numbers that can, that can be represented over n plus 1 uh, bits only when i is exponential. So, so there's a, a huge gap between the actually constant number of, of frames uh, that lambda PDR requires to arrive at an invariant in this example, and the exponential number required for exact forward reachability to do the same, demonstrating significant over approximation and that's achieved in, in Lambda PDR. Uh, we also have a similar gap uh, between Lambda PDR and the variant of uh, model-based, dual interpolation-based invariant inference algorithm. Uh, and uh, uh, the details are in the paper. Uh, if anyone wants to ask anything or comment anything or cry a cry of outrage, okay. Uh, so we know that Lambda PDR performs 
a significant overall approximation. And now our goal is to systematically understand this overall approximation uh, using the uh, what's in, in verification formal methods, the classical theory of the overall approximation, uh, which is abstract interpretation. So I don't know if you all if you're all familiar with abstract interpretation, uh, and and it's a, it's a cool thing. So let me try to give a taste of that using um, a, a simpler domain than what we're actually going to use to understand lambda PDR. So using the domain of, of predicate abstraction. Uh, so here's a very quick abridged and a personal uh, uh, view of uh, uh, how an introduction to abstract interpretation can can go. So uh, if we look at the example we, we had, uh, we have an example uh, system that uh, starts from zero and iteratively adds two, and we want to uh, understand um, its behavior over uh, um, an un unbounded number of steps. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to transform this uh, so-called concrete program to an uh, abstract program, uh, which here would look something like that. So the, the initial state is, is uh, uh, seemingly the same. Uh, the, the, the variable starts from uh, zero. Uh, and then what happens in each step is that, um, so now actually each uh, x, xi can be either uh, zero, one, or star. Um, and what happens in each step is that uh, x1, which is the list, almost least, uh, least significant bit um, gets a star. And every other frame, every other variable gets a star if, or is modified to be a star, otherwise it's, it remains the same. If all the lower bits except for x0 are uh, either one or, or a star. So when we execute this uh, abstract program, it uh, starts from uh, everything is zero. Then after one iteration, x1 gets a star. In the next iteration, x1 uh, is still a star and x2 gets a star. In the next iteration, this propagates also to uh, x3 uh, and so on until uh, we converge uh, to, uh, to the value where everything is star except for the least significant bit. And when we continue executing this program, we, we remain at, at this value. So, um, so I think it's fair to say that the program converges to this value. Um, so, okay, this seems like um, stars are, we all, we all like stars, but what's the meaning of this? Uh, I, I meant the astronomical kind, not the Hollywood kind. Anyway, so um, to ascribe meaning to what happens here, we want to uh, uh, define what's called a concretization function, gamma, uh, which here uh, takes uh, a value, a state of the abstract program, uh, where uh, each xi is either uh, zero, one, or, or a star. Uh, and uh, what the fun what gamma returns is a, a set of concrete states, a set of states of the original program. And here I, I'm going to define it as uh, returning the set of um, the set of states that agree with um, with the abstract state, except where the abstract state contains a star, and then uh, uh, um, the concrete state can be either one or zero. So a star is like, uh, don't care. Uh, you may have seen that coming. Uh, so for example, the concretization of the initial states is the, uh, the set of states that is represented by this conjunction. So all the variables are zero, but after uh, one step, uh, one conjunct is, is removed. Uh, so now uh, all the states that satisfy this formula uh, are uh, uh, in the concretization uh, and there is no constraint on X1. Uh, in the, the next iteration of the abstract, abstract program, the constraint about x2 is removed. Uh, and, and this continues until uh, uh, in the final value of the abstract program, what we get is uh, that the least significant bit is zero, which is actually the inductive invariant. So, so somehow, uh, maybe it wasn't a coincidence, we converged to the inductive invariant of the program. Uh, and if we can guarantee that the, the abstract program is constructed in a sound way, then uh, this uh, gives us a proof that um, uh, that uh, this uh, x0 equals 0 is an inductive invariant for the original program, uh, and the safety of the original program, of the concrete program, is established. Um, 
And what abstract interpretation gives us is a, a method, um, uh, many methods, but at least the basic version gives us a method for, uh, for constructing such abstract programs. And, and the idea here is that uh, the set of initial states of the abstract program is taken to be the most precise uh, abstract element whose concretization includes all the initial states. And in each step, the, the, next, uh, the next abstract state of the abstract program is taken to be the most precise uh, element whose concretization includes um, uh, both the concretization of the previous uh, abstract element, what we started from, and also uh, the concrete post image, the states that are exactly reachable in one step from uh, what we got in the previous iteration of the abstract program. Uh, so, so this is uh, what happens here. Uh, uh, and the, the, the important the point about this is that when we say the most precise value, this, uh, um, uh, th this means the most precise value from a certain abstract domain. So uh, um, if we could express all uh, uh, sets of states, then uh, this would be exactly exact forward reachability. Um, because that, that would be the most precise thing to do. And what we do here is that we uh, constrain our abstract values um, to be only con uh, uh, not arbitrary formulas, but always a conjunction. Uh, so a conjunction of variables and negations of variables. Uh, in this case, we only need to say that uh, some variables are uh, equal to zero, so it's a conjunction of, of negations. Um, and what happened in the execution of the abstract program is that we uh, took the most precise a conjunction that contains the exact post image of uh, um, all the states that uh, satisfy the previous conjunction we had. So this is the uh, classical domain of uh, uh, predicate abstraction uh, abstract domain. Uh, and, uh, and what we what we need to do to explain lambda PDR is to take a slightly uh, more sophisticated domain. And the reason is that uh, uh, the formulas that uh, PDR and lambda, lambda PDR generate are not only conjunctions. The, um, uh, the conjunctions of dis disjunctions, uh, formulas in, in conjunctive normal form. Uh, uh, so we need a, a more expressive domain, uh, and it's also uh, somewhat more complicated. Any questions so far? OK. Uh, so the, the abstract domain we're going to take is the uh, monotone span domain um, and it's uh, it's a uh, it's a logical domain it's again a, a domain of logical formulas um, and the formula belongs to the monotone span of the set bk if it if the formula can be expressed as a conjunction of some clauses such such that each clause excludes some state from bk uh, they that the, this may may ring a bell but, uh, for, for example uh, if we take BK to be the singleton set of the bad state from the example we had at the beginning, uh, then uh, this formula uh, belongs to the monotone span of BK. And this is because each, each of the clauses independently excludes the, uh, the counter example from BK. However, uh, uh, this formula, which uh, actually corresponds to the set of states uh, zero and, and two, this formula doesn't belong to the monotone span. And the reason is that these clauses that I marked here by themselves don't exclude any of the states in, in BK. So because uh, the conjunction actually agrees with the, the value in, in the state there. Uh, so although the formula, um, the entire formula excludes that state, um, uh, um, it, these clauses independently don't do that. And for this reason, this formula doesn't belong to the monotone span. Uh, okay, so this is the definition of the abstract domain. And now we're going to uh, uh, construct an abstract program or in, in more technical terms, uh, we're going to set up a Galois connection between the monotone span domain and the concrete domain of sets of states. So given a formula in the monotone span domain, its concretization is um, the set of states that satisfy the formula. Uh, is the, the usual definition for, for a logical abstract domain. Um, given a set of states, uh, the, it's the abstraction, which is the most precise abstract element whose concretization includes the, uh, the original set, um, 
it's uh, just that. So, for example, uh, uh, the set, the abstraction of the set that uh, consists of zero and two is this formula on the right, uh, all the even numbers with most significant bit zero. Uh, now to uh, construct a program or an iteration of the program, uh, we use the what's called the best abstract transformer. So we start from an abstract element, take the concretization, we then take the exact post image of the concretization, all the states which are in one step uh, from the concretization. We take uh, all of this together and take the abstraction. This gives us a new abstract element, a new uh, formula in the moment on span domain. Uh, so this is actually the, the classical definition of the best abstract transformer. Um, so from uh, some abstract element, we got to another uh, abstract element that, um, that over approximates uh, the exact post image uh, for, of, the, of the previous abstract element. Um, so, so, for example, um, uh, uh, if what we get in the exact post image is zero and two, then what we get is the result of the best abstract transformer is uh, this formula, all the even numbers with most significant bit zero. And what's interesting is that this int actually introduces over approximation, that the concretization of that formula includes many states beyond those that are exactly reachable, um, because it includes also four and six and eight and, and so on. Uh, so uh, by taking the, the best, uh, the most precise thing in, in, that can be expressed in the abstract domain, we've introduced over approximation. Uh, and the, the main point of this abstract domain is that we can prove that uh, an iteration of lambda PDR or the relation between successive frames uh, of lambda PDR exactly corresponds to, um, uh, to uh, an application of the best abstract transformer in the monotone span domain. So the, the next frame of lambda PDR is always given as the best abstract, abstract transformer from the previous frame of lambda PDR. And this is for one iteration, uh, uh, the relation between successive frames. Um, uh, so, so for example, uh, uh, in the example we had before, what we have on the left is actually the exact post image of the set of initial states. And what we have on the right is actually the first frame of lambda PDR when we execute it on, on, on this example. And when we take uh, such a multiple, uh, or, or all the iterations of lambda PDR together, what we get is that uh, um, lambda PDR actually performs this kind of abstract interpretation in this ab abstract domain, or in more technical terms, uh, the frames of lambda PDR are actually cleaning iterations in the monotone span domain. Uh, OK, so, so this gives us an understanding of uh, uh, the over approximation in lambda PDR as a form of uh, abstract interpretation. Uh, to gain more understanding of uh, what this over approximation actually is, uh, we need to have, uh, or we want to have, a more effective definition of the abstraction function, the function that gives the most precise abstract element um, uh, that represents uh, it, the, the original set and maybe additional, additional states. And uh, it turns out, and uh, we prove this uh, in the paper, that this actually corresponds to uh, a known uh, operator, a known function that was defined by Beschutti uh, in, in, uh, in monotone theory in the context of exact concept learning. Um, I want to give a, a geometric, uh, geometric taste of uh, what this uh, operator does. Um, so uh, suppose we, we have some frame of lambda PDR and we take the, the exact post image of that frame. And now uh, what uh, the next frame of lambda PDR is going to be the monotone hull of that. And that's sort of a completion uh, operator that uh, adds uh, uh, not only the states that are exactly reachable, but all the states that um, the exact post image stands between them and the and BK, the set of counter examples. So sigma is included. Uh, the state sigma is included in the monotone hull if between sigma and any uh, counter example in BK, there's sh some uh, shortest path in the Hamming cube, uh, shortest path in Hamming distance that uh, intersects uh, the exact post image. So, uh, so in, in a sense, sigma is protected uh, uh, from exclusion, from exclusion uh, due to any of the counter examples. Um, so I think that uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the exact uh, uh, 
the, the formal definition. Uh, all the details are in the paper, and uh, we can also uh, talk about it later. Um, but the the, um, the fact that uh, the abstraction in this abstract domain and what actually happens in Lambda PDR uh, uh, can be explained through this moment on how operator gives us very powerful tools, both to analyze Lambda PDR on specific, specific examples and also to, uh, uh, in the next set of results that uh, I want to talk about, which are concerned with convergence bounds. Uh, okay, so uh, we know that Lambda PDR forms some form of abstract interpretation in the monotone span domain. And now the uh, question I think is uh, really interesting and important is how many iterations are actually going to be required for Lambda PDR before it converges? Um, how many iterations are required uh, to arrive at an invariant in this abstract domain? So the usual answers to, to such questions are concerned with in abstract interpretations uh, are concerned with properties of the abstract domain um, and saying that uh, it's impossible to traverse the, the abstract domain uh, um, in, uh, in too long a path. But unfortunately, in this case, the monotone span always has uh, an exponential lattice height. So there are always cases, always uh, programs where the monotone span uh, domain uh, is inefficient and a lambda PDR uh, would require an exponential number of iterations to converge. So to understand when this doesn't happen and lambda PDR actually does converge in few iterations, we need to consider not uh, uh, only properties of the abstract domain, but also properties of the specific transition system. Uh, so what we're uh, going to show uh, is to what we're going to derive uh, upper bounds on the number of frames uh, in Lambda PDR um, uh, using uh, expressions derived from syntactic properties of the set of initial states and the transition relation. And specifically for the case that uh, BK is, uh, is a single cube, uh, a, conjun a single conjunction of variables and negations of variables, then we can show uh, this uh, upper bound which is uh, the DNF size of the monotone hull of the transition relation uh, formula plus one. So this quantity is best understood through an example. Uh, so if we go back to the very same example and write the uh, transition relation formula, so it, this is a formula over two copies of the vocabulary relating pre-states of the system to post-states of the system, um, the states before and after the transition, the prime vocabulary indicates the post state. So this formula says that uh, we can go from zero to two and from two to four and from four to six and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, I think I've demonstrated several times today that I, I can count, but uh, it, it actually shows something uh, more interesting than that. Um, and, uh, and actually in this case, written in disjunctive normal form as um, a disjunction of conjunctions then this is the most uh, succinct representation of the transition relation formula. And it has an exponential number of terms uh, in this formula. Uh, now to, to apply the theorem, we want to take the monotone hull of the transition relation formula uh, and uh, the, the subscript, subscript um, is with respect to uh, uh, BK, which is assumed to be a conjunction uh, so with respect to BK in the post state and with respect to the bitwise negation of the of BK in the pre-state. Uh, so uh, results from the monotone theory tell us that this uh, um, monotone hull of the transition relation formula can be computed by looking at the DNF representation of the transition relation and looking at uh, the places where the, the literals agree with the literals in the subscript of the monotone hull and just dropping all those literals. Uh, so if we drop those literals, we get uh, the a DNF representation of the monotone hull of the transition relation formula. Uh, and when we look uh, at that representation, it turns out that this uh, uh, term that's generated by this process actually subsumes all the other terms. So this formula can be written um, using uh, actually just a, a, a constant number of terms, uh, even just one. Uh, so what the theorem implies is that uh, 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 Lambda PDR converges in, uh, in this case, in a constant number of frames, in actually 
uh, just two because the DNF size, uh, the shortest representation is a DNF formula of the monotone half of the transition relation uh, is, is very, very short. Uh, and I mean, in this case, this is actually tight uh, for uh, the convergence of lambda PDR, but this is absolutely not uh, always the case. Um, we also have an, an extension of this theorem to the case when BK is not a single conjunction, but a, a disjunction of several conjunctions. And in this case, the bound, bound involves a product uh, of the monotone halves monotone hull, with respect to the uh, different uh, uh, different uh, conjunct, different disjuncts in the representation of BK. And the proof, I think, is uh, interesting uh, because it uh, what what it does is to construct a new transition system, what we call an abstract transition system, um, uh, whose transition relation is uh, the monotone hull of the of the original uh, transition relation. Uh, and this has the, the interesting property that if you execute exact forward reachability on the abstract transition system, this yields exactly lambda PDR on the original transition system. So uh, exact reachability on the abstract system gives the abstract reachability on the original uh, system. Um, uh, then we use some uh, a bound on the diameter or a bound on uh, uh, on, we bound the number of iterations of exact forward reachability on the abstract transition system. And here we use a very uh, simple and uh, sometimes naive bound of the DNF size of the, tra the transition relation formula. Uh, and this gives us uh, the theorem. And in the case that uh, a BK consists not of a single cube, but, a, but actually a disjunction, we need to consider not an abstract transition system, but a, an abstract hyper transition system. Um, and uh, again, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip the illustration of how this uh, uh, abstract transition system and uh, abstract hyper transition transition systems look like. But we can go back to it if you're interested. Uh, so overall, I talked about uh, lambda PDR, a theoretical algorithm that we use to analyze over approximation in standard PDR. We show that lambda PDR is equivalent to an abstract interpretation procedure in a new domain based on uh, uh, notions from the monotone theory, uh, uh, work in exact concept learning, we show that this can lead to a significant over approximation and uh, exponential gaps between lambda PDR and algorithms that use exact, exact forward reachability. And we also provided general bounds on the uh, convergence of lambda PDR. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, so I have a question from a collaborator who saw your abstract and said, wow, does this work in practice? Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, so, so PDR does work in practice. Um, uh, and, and our task was to, to understand, oh, I mean, we hope to understand why, why this happens. Uh, this is a, a first step towards that. Um, Lambda PDR is, is, as I said, a theoretical algorithm. So um, we haven't implemented it, at least not, not recently, or not anything that I can vouch on. Um, and uh, and it, it's used to um, uh, as a device to study over approximation as a, a conceptual tool. Um, I used to say that, uh, it, like it seems uh, outrageously uh, outrageous and hopelessly hopeless to implement uh, or to, to probably and okay, uh, but now I need a slightly more refined answer. I, uh, results from next from last week possibly indicate that maybe we can prove some. Uh, actual complexity bounds or provide, uh, at, at least in theory, an efficient implementation of Lambda PDR, but uh, maybe not. We still need to, to figure that out. Um, uh, it's also in a very interesting direction to see whether uh, probably Lambda PDR uh, uh, in itself won't be a good idea in practice. I think I also have a slide for that. Uh, so, so we have some examples in the paper that show that uh, taking the most precise thing, the most precise uh, abstract element in the abstract domain, 
can result in uh, a slow convergence uh, in some cases of range that are very hard to, to express in a formula. So it's not, probably not the best idea to, to do in practice all the time. Uh, whether some of the ideas of Lambda PDR can be incorporated into standard PDR, I think that's a very interesting question. Thanks. Um, actually, uh, there's a question in the chat, but I think you've answered all of them. OK, there's a second question. Uh, I think you're looking at this from the point of view that PDI is basically over approximating forward reachability, assuming that's correct. Uh, what about the other direction? How does Lambda PDI compare to just doing straight backward reachability? Yeah, uh, so that's an excellent question. Um, sorry for, I mean, I'm not giving out grades to the questions, but I mean, um, anyway. Uh, so I'd really like to, to be able to answer this question. And, and indeed, we showed a gap between Lambda PDI and exact for reachability. Um, there's also the dual question of showing that PDR doesn't over approximate too much and uh, results to, uh, to backward reachability. Um, uh, I, I don't know how to explain this phenomenon theoretically, and that's because um, uh, PDR is, is very asymmetric. So to do the other direction, we need, uh, it seems like we need uh, completely different tools. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting question. Thanks. OK, I have another question. Oh, sorry. Yep, go on. Yeah, so my, my question is, so could you maybe uh, go talk a bit more about these uh, hypertransition sim systems because I've been seeing some some similarities to some things in in monotone model logic, and I'm wondering if if they're there. In in monotone what logic? Sorry, I didn't monotone modal logic. Ah, okay. Um, I don't remember exactly what happens in in, in model logic. Um, the it was like slightly inconvenient. There, there are all sorts of different definitions for hyper transition systems. Um, and uh, what we used is, is in a sense, the a dual definition for something uh, that's been uh, previously defined. Um, so what happens, what happens here is that um, it's so, I mean, in our definition, it's sort of a, a conjunction. So to be able to uh, arrive at, uh, say, uh, sigma three, um, uh, you need uh, uh, like, um, two, two pre-states. One is sigma two and one is sigma three. Um, so, so from two states, uh, um, yeah, um, you need both, both states to be able to arrive at, uh, at sigma three. There are also uh, like dual definitions. Um, yeah, but, but this is the, the one that was uh, uh, useful for us. And, and the reason here is that, um, we need to account for um, like the monotone monotone hull with respect to a cube lets us um, move away from that cube. And here we need to, to know that we can uh, get to the same state by moving away from two different cubes. And uh, in general, that, that, can, that may uh, arise from uh, starting from two different states. So this is why a hyper transition system arises here. The, um, the bound on the Diameter of the hyper transition system we use, the number of, uh, of steps before it, the maximum number of, uh, of unique states in an execution. Um, uh, so here it becomes the maximum, maximum depth of a system uh, without performing the same transition uh, twice or without arri arriving at, at the same uh, state multiple times. Um, and uh, essentially, the, the same bound works uh, also here. The DNF size of the this uh, hyper transition relation formula. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I have another question. So, so one of the advantages, or, or maybe even reasons, for decomposing an existing algorithm or system uh, is that you know when you understand how how it works, you, you can then try to replace different parts, maybe with better parts. Uh, 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 um, do you have any insights that you know that can apply here? You know, which what are the moving parts you can try to replace to get variations on the algorithm and so on? Um, uh, it's a bit of a soft question. Sorry. 
No, no, nothing wrong with those questions. Um, um, the, well, I think the, the, the may, maybe two points. One is a realization coming from this work about uh, over approximating the, the exact post image and that this arises because um, uh, some interaction with the syntactic shape of uh, frames and the set of counter examples. So maybe thinking about um, or, uh, taking that uh, into account when thinking about uh, which counter examples we're using uh, and maybe the, the geometry of, this, uh, of these counter examples, maybe this could be an interesting direction. Um, uh, so this is uh, one aspect of this. The other is that um, uh, it sort of, uh, to me at least, concept, it let us go uh, beyond the usual uh, view of uh, frames as uh, conjunctions of, of clauses that arise somehow. And here they have a very precise mathematical definition. And uh, the, the conjunctive, the CNF uh, uh, representation is not, not the only one. You can also think about a DNF representation or a representation as a conjunction of DNF formulas. Um, uh, so maybe uh, going beyond the, the specific syntactic in the structure, uh, there are many challenges of doing that, but uh, to me, it's something to think about. <laughs> 